welcome everybody to this session on western political thought in this episode we will discuss the ideas of a very famous 19th century british political philosopher his name is thomas hill green commonly known as t h green his period is from 1836 to 1882 now at the very outset i should first of all explain to you that thomas hill green he is a, of course a very uh, distinguished political philosopher a political thinker a political theorist of 19th century britain but it is rather strange that t h green's ideas are not discussed much in the standard textbooks on history of political thought rather western political thought the reasons are very simple t h green developed his ideas primarily as a liberal political philosopher and t h green of course belongs to the tradition of english liberal ideas or english liberal tradition yet t h green's liberalism is quite different from two standard variations or two standard types of liberalism which were popular which were quite predominant in 19th century england now what were these two standard traditions of liberalism one was lockean liberalism with its focus on natural rights with its focus on say uh, the freedom of the individual etc etc the other tradition was associated with utilitarians utilitarian tradition was associated as all of you know with a very famous and in fact he is known as the father figure of english utilitarianism his name was jeremy bentham so benthamite utilitarianism in one way and lockean liberalism in another way well these these were the two standard varieties these were the two standard variations on the basis of which liberalism flourished in 19th century britain so far as t h green is concerned it can be argued that he was of course a liberal but liberal with a difference in what sense he was different because of two reasons number 1 t h green questioned contested the claims of lockean liberalism as well as benthamite utilitarianism number 2 the second reason is that t h green developed his liberalism he was a very staunch defender of liberal values he was a staunch defender of rights he was a staunch defender of freedom yet he developed all these ideas by associating them with a philosophy or with a tradition which was not at all popular in britain that is the tradition of idealism idealism by this time all of you know it flourished in germany and idealism had its primary focus on the metaphysical concept of consciousness mind god etc now this is something that is you start off your discussion with focus on such abstract concepts such metaphysical concepts like say god say an abstract uh, notion of consciousness an abstract notion of mind an abstract notion of idea as we come as we come across in hegel now these are things which were not at all popular in britain that is the british tradition particularly the liberal tradition well it was very strongly grounded in what is given what is objective what is experienced what we come across in our everyday life thomas hill greens understanding was quite different so what he actually tried to develop was what he tried to talk about was or what he tried to put forward was that he developed his defense of liberalism but in the context of idealism by linking it with idealism 
Now, idealism and liberalism, how do you relate the two? This is the unique uh, contribution of T.H. Green. In fact, T.H. Green, so far as the study of Western political thought is concerned, well, T.H. Green is very well known, very famous because of his contribution to a unique understanding of state, unique liberal defense of the state, which, however, he developed, as I have already mentioned, on the basis of the premises of idealism. How he did it, that is how T.H. Green defended a unique understanding of state in order to arrive at this understanding, we, however, first of all, require a proper, a cogent, a clear understanding of his political philosophy. That is, the premises of his philosophy, the orientation of his political philosophy. To have an understanding of the core ideas of T.H. Green, so far as his political philosophy is concerned, well, we have to focus on basically two things. Number one, his metaphysical principle. He developed his, you can call it metaphysical, you, call, you can call it philosophical. That is, it is a very abstract principle. And there you will come across as I explain it very briefly, that this is where actually the idealist core of T.H. Green, the idealistic orientation of T.H. Green uh, becomes very strongly evident. Now, what is that principle? The principle essentially which T.H. Green tries to espouse is this, that when we look at our objective world, when we try to understand the objective world, or when we arrive at an understanding of an object which we see, which we experience, then we arrive at an understanding of that object. It may be X, it may be Y, it may be Z, whatever be the object. Now, we arrive at an understanding of this object in terms of the relationships which constitute that object. That is, object means, after all, a kind of coordination of certain relationships. So, when you describe something as a rose, that means it is a rose in the sense it is a flower, but there are many other kinds of flowers, but it is rose which is, say, different from another kind of flower. So, in other words, you call a particular flower rose because the object or that particular entity called rose, it is a rose because as the, it is characterized by certain relationships which are unique for that object rose. Now, Green's understanding is this. This coordination of relationships, this act of establishing relationships, this act of identifying relationships, this is done by the human mind, that is the consciousness. This is where idealism comes into the picture. I have already explained to you that idealism's central focus is on consciousness. So this is the metaphysical, philosophical principle underlying T.H. Green's uh, understanding. Now I come to another foundation of T.H. Green's understanding. One, as I have already explained, is the philosophical principle, the metaphysical principle, the other principle is the moral principle. So far as the moral principle is concerned, this is also very interesting. In the defense of this moral principle, or in his description, or in his analysis of the moral principle, T.H. Green was largely influenced by two thinkers. One was the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, and the other, the great Greek philosopher Aristotle. In two different ways, Kant in one way, Aristotle in another way, well, influenced T.H. Green's ideas. Now, how does the moral principle uh, come into the picture? What is T.H. Green's unique understanding of this moral principle? The unique understanding is this. Like Kant, or from Kant actually, he picks up the idea that every individual, every human being is an autonomous moral being. I, as an individual, I am characterized by my moral personality. And as an autonomous moral being, I am free to conduct, to pursue my activities. 
So, autonomy of the human mind, autonomy of human being as a moral person, this idea of freedom, this idea of autonomy, he picks up from Kant. But then he associates this idea with the ideas of Aristotle. That is, what he picks up from Aristotle is this, that I as an individual, well, I am a moral being in the sense, or I, my entity, my identity as a moral being is meaningful only in relation to the collectivity of society, in relation to society. As all of you perhaps know that Aristotle made this famous pronouncement, that is the state, that is in Aristotle's time, the polis is prior to the individual. So T. H. Green also argued that I as an individual, my, my meaning as an individual or my significance as an individual, well, it becomes really meaningful, it becomes truly significant when I associate myself with the collectivity of society. What is meant by this idea of collectivity of society? Collectivity of society means that I am not simply concerned with my own interest, I am concerned with others' interests also. That is, I am a true, proper, moral being only when I am concerned with the larger interest of society in a moral, ethical perspective. So these are the two ideas, one idea picked up from Kant, the other idea picked up from Aristotle, which go into the making of T.H. Green's moral philosophy. From this, that is, if we pick up these two ideas, or if we can, if we, as we have done it, we have identified the two uh, the core foundational principles of T.H. Green. One is his metaphysical principle, the other is his moral principle. Once we arrive at an identification of these two ideas, from this we come to the final, uh, uh, the, the, the most uh, important contribution of T.H. Green. In, in fact, this is what goes into the making of the essence of T.H. Green's political philosophy. That is his idea of common good. And here he distinguishes himself from Lockean liberalism and English utilitarianism. So far as Lockean liberalism is concerned, all of you know, Lockean liberalism focuses on the individual's rights, individual's freedoms, the natural rights of the individual to the exclusion of the social collective. So far as utilitarianism, Benthamite utilitarianism is concerned, Bentham's entire focus was on maximization of happiness of the individual. That is how the individual attains pleasure or happiness and only in terms of the maximization of my pleasure, well, I will judge every action, every policy or every program, uh, whether it is initiated by the government or whether it is initiated by any other agency. So the yardstick ultimately for Locke as well as for Bentham is the individual. In Locke's case, it is individual rights. In Bentham's case, it is individual's uh, consideration of pleasure. It, if it maximizes my pleasure and it serves my utility, I accept it. If it maximizes my pain, I dismiss it. That is the typical utilitarian understanding. Now, T.H. Green's understanding is completely different in the sense he dismisses this emphasis on the individual. That does not mean, of course, that he dismisses the individual per se, not that. He very strongly defends the individual, the cause of the individual, the freedom of the individual, the rights of the individual, but his understanding is this, I as an individual become a true meaningful individual only when my rights, my freedoms, well, they contribute to and they do not clash with the interests, rights, freedoms of other individuals. That means, and therein comes, uh, there, 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 therein actually in this context, one comes across the notion of common good. 
that is my exercise of rights my exercise of freedom it must be balanced with the collective interest the common good of society this being the essence the gist of th greens understanding let us now look at the arguments or the principles on the basis of which th green develops this notion of common good and here we come across three central arguments of th green these three central arguments constitutes the notion of uh, his uh, understanding of common good and with that i will conclude this topic now what is the first principle the first principle is why he defends the notion of common good what is his justification of the idea of common good as distinct from uh, lockean defense of natural rights or benthamite defense of say utilitarian understanding of the uh, individual's happiness the first argument is this when you talk of common good that means you can envisage the idea of something which is shared by all people which is shared by all members of society and thereby you contribute to that is in fact all individuals thereby are contributing to the idea of a common good a kind a notion of say happiness which is shared by all in society and that means there is no conflict it is assumed there is no conflict that is a common good is a proposition the common good is a concept which presupposes that there is no conflict between my notion of happiness my interest my rights and your interest your happiness it is possible for all individuals to contribute to the making of the the notion of common good so it is possible that is a non conflictual relationship my right my freedom will not clash with your freedom your right so this is a non conflictual understanding and only by presupposing this idea that it is possible to arrive at a non conflictual understanding uh, of say happiness uh, non conflictual understanding of freedom in the sense that my freedom will not clash with your freedom well that will contribute to the making of common good which is good for society which is morally justiciable and which is actually required for betterment of society please remember one thing that th green is always concerned with how the society can be improved upon how it is possible to arrive at a betterment of society and he believes that this whole notion of betterment of society this whole notion of improvement of society well that is possible only when uh, individuals are aware of the fact in fact in fact he focuses on this point that individuals well they themselves can contribute to the making of the common good because after all individuals they are moral persons they are moral beings in other words th green has a very strong faith in the moral capacity of the individual not only f- to enable himself to better to improve his uh, moral capacities he also pins strong faith in the capacity of the individual to contribute to the collective improvement of society in terms of its moral dimension that is every society for th green is meaningful only when the society is able to develop when the society is able to promote certain moral values so this is the first argument of th green now the second argument of th green so far as his uh, defense of the notion of common good his vindication his justification of the notion of common good is concerned now what is his th green's second argument the second argument is this he believes and this again follows from his say uh, uh, from uh, from from his uh, association with uh, aristotelian ideas is the strong influence of aristotle on uh, th green he argues that every individual is an end in itself that is every individual as a moral being 
is an end in itself in the sense that every individual has to consider. And he says that it is possible for an individual to arrive at this understanding. It is possible for an individual to arrive at this for formulation. It is possible for an individual to become aware of this notion, to be aware of this uh, feeling that after all, as an individual, well, I, just as I am an end in itself, I am not a means, I am not a pawn in a, any power game. So I am an end in itself in the sense that I am a moral being. I have the capacity, I have the potentiality, I have the possibility to develop myself as a proper, fully, full-fledged human being. And proper, full-fledged human being means that I am a moral person. Now, just as this understanding is relevant for me, I as a moral being, I as an individual who is guided by this moral sensibility. So I have the possibility also to understand that I have to treat, I have to consider, I have to look upon other individuals also as ends in themselves. In other words, when I am concerned with my right, with my freedom, with the exercise of my right, with the exercise of my freedom, when I want to satisfy some of my wills, then I as a moral being have the possibility of being guided by the consideration that other individuals, their rights, their freedoms, well, their will, their wish, they are as important as mine. They are as sacred as mine. They are as important as mine. Therefore, my, in the exercise of my right, in the exercise of my freedom, in the satisfaction of my wish, in the satisfaction of my will, I must not be, I must not create a situation or I must not be, I must not allow myself to engage in a situation where the satisfaction of my interest, the satisfaction of my will goes in a kind of conflict or it leads to a conflict with the will, wish, demands of another person. In other words, I must not allow the satisfaction of my rights, demands, wills, whatever be, in a spirit of selfishness. Rather, I must be guided by a moral feeling. That moral feeling is altruism. That is, I must think of others in society. That is common, and this is how actually the notion of commonness, the notion of common good, common good here, it actually means you can understand. It means the totality of the will of others, the totality of the sense of will of others, totality of the sense of a kind of goodness which is shared by others. That is, all people in this society, they will participate in this uh, notion of common good. They will share this notion of common good. They will share this notion of happiness. It is not a notion of happiness which in the Benthamite fashion will simply lead to or will simply uh, uh, contribute to the selfish satisfaction of, say, an individual's pleasure or happiness. And now I come to the third and final uh, principle of, the, of which justifies or which actually uh, explains the justification of T.H. Green's notion of common good. This is a very interesting uh, way of, say, justification of the notion of common good. Very unusual, very unconventional. T.H. Green says that after all, all human beings, they are mortals. They have a limited lifespan. But I have certain, I am guided by certain 
moral consideration. A moral consideration uh, means that I have to contribute to. They, they, this is actually my a kind of moral imperative which guides me towards a contribution to the happiness, the goodness of society. But I will die. So, after all, I have my a very limited lifespan. But the spirit of sharing, the spirit of goodness, that must survive, that must live on. So how is it possible? It is possible only when I project this idea in the realm of, I in the realm of ideas. That is, I project this notion of common good in the realm of ideas. That is, I will die, but the spirit will live on. How can that spirit live on? If I can project this spirit, so collectively throughout society. If I can spread this message in society that after all, I will not live. I have a short life. I have a limited time span. But when I will no longer be there as a mortal, the spirit of sharing that will live on. The spirit of sharing is the spirit of common good. The notion of common good, in other words, it constitutes the essence, the core, the moral foundation of human society and only by sharing the spirit of common good, well, it is possible for the society to live on. Thank you.